Europe is unusual, I think, because it's a cultural construct, it's a geographical area, and now, of course, it's a political uh, project. And to me, Europe has never really been about a place, a location, geography. It's always been much more about an idea, about an identity, about a discourse. But the idea was never to say Europe should to replace national identities or a European a government should replace uh, national governments. It is the source of ideas and values um, which have had a huge audience, a huge constituency across the world. Uh, and so in that sense, Europe is much more about the ways we interact and the ways we think rather than of the location we might be in when we're doing it. Countries apply to join Europe uh, in the sense of wishing to be part of a, of a family of nations, part of a, a political project. No country applies to join Asia or, or South America. Europe is, is attractive, right? People want to come here. Uh, we should be, in a way, part of this. They, they, they don't want to leave, they want to come. There are questions here, of course, as to the very purpose and mission of uh, the European Union, what it is to be inclusive, what, what is it for. Here we have a set of proud and old, in some cases almost ancient, nation-states who have had throughout their history competing interests and often conflicting interests. And yet, Europeans have found a way, a set of arrangements, which all have accepted, which enables them to resolve their disputes without threats or blackmail or war. They haven't fought each other for 60 years and that's been a success model. So that is an extraordinary achievement. The very beginnings of the European Union can be linked to the establishment of the European Coal and Steel Community. On May the 9th, 1950, Robert Schuman, the French Foreign Minister, made a key announcement about the initiative to establish what became the Coal and Steel Community with six participant countries. That was then uh, taken much further with the Treaty of Rome and the establishment of the European Economic Community in 1958. The commitment which Europeans made in the Treaty of Rome and which many more European nations have made since then is one to a set of arrangements which they believe ensures peace, um, which enables them to trade as easily as possible with each other. You could also see Europe as a project that tries to solve problems that individual member states can't solve. So Europe now uh, tackles questions which were not considered uh, before. Migration, uh, and uncontrolled movements of people. A single European currency. Terrorism, organised crime, pollution. A de common defence policy, a common foreign policy climate change, there are many such challenges. All of these create new kinds of questions about governance. The motor behind it has very much been this idea of Pareto efficiency, which can be explained by saying that some people or some nation states are better off and no one is worse off. Of course, that's the sort of deal that people can buy into. What is problematic, of course, is the monetary union. That's a very different thing. A monetary union needs an intense political unification by that I mean creating a European government with the power to spend and to tax embedded in a democracy. And I think one of the challenges that Europe has had is that it's stuck with the original governance model of the 1950s uh, for rather too long, uh, at a time when it was deepening its uh, economic integration and enlarging its membership with countries which had different purposes and motives for joining. The strategy that the architects of the monetary union had in the back of their mind was that um, by starting a monetary union you would force almost automatically a political union. And they were optimistic about this and I think that there they have been wrong. You can't force 28 countries or, or a larger number of countries to all go in exactly the same direction across this wide spectrum of policy areas. What kind of governance can we have for a Europe of 28 soon to be even more member states with an economic heterogeneity, uh, but also with a diversity in terms of interests, motives and 
political conceptions. I think it's rather limiting to think of Europe only and exclusively about the European Union. And even when, of course, I agree this is a very important part, it's not the only part. Most of my research is actually looking at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which goes from Vancouver to Vladivostok, which takes in Central Asia. Equally, the idea of the Council of Europe, which was formed early on in the post-Second World War period as the locus of the European Convention for Human Rights, which is the most significant regional, judicially enforced human rights instrument in the world. And that organization existed before the EU. And, you know, one could say if the EU runs into a wall over all of the problems we're recently seeing, Council of Europe may well exist after the EU. If, European, if the European Union stopped being there tomorrow, I think we'd have some other forms of European cooperation. Realistically and practically, how many countries can join the European Union if the European Union is still to operate effectively? Europe ultimately has to have some kind of exclusive uh, character about it. Some are Europeans and some uh, are not. It's always like that when you create a club, there are some, some countries or some people who are members and some who are not. So people at the moment are nervous about extending the European Union beyond a point at which it risks coming apart. Um, the forces of fragmentation in Europe right now are very powerful. But of course, where we set the boundary and what we mean by the identity question is something which changes over time, even in the short term. Well, in the treaties it says that the limit is that any European state can apply. So that would quite clearly, I guess, not include Northern Africa. Uh, however, that could include perhaps Ukraine, you know, perhaps even Russia. I mean, that's obviously not on the cards, but it's not something that's been clearly defined. This is where, for example, public opinion becomes relevant because the resistance to Turkish membership, a lot of that came from public opinion. Turkey is, of course, a Muslim country. Is that a problem for Europe? Of course, the origins of uh, Europe as a term uh, starts with the Greeks. Uh, and. Aristotle talked about uh, Europeans uh, in contradistinction to those from the Near East, etc. Well, the idea of a European identity emerged slowly in the course of the Middle Ages and into to the Renaissance. Um, people thought of themselves first and foremost in Europe, obviously, just as, as, as Christians, defining themselves at time against an other. And I say other with a capital O. Um, and that other for a chunk of Europe's history, of course, was Islam. Well, now there have always historically been Muslims in Europe. We do have a problem with terrorism, and that is a real problem. And it's not just Britain's problem. Muslim countries also have a problem, by the way, with Muslim-inspired terrorism. So again, that could be a source of unification, just as much as it could be a source of differentiation. Those people who embrace multiculturalism and who embrace diversity are much more likely to be in favour of the European project and European integration than those who have exclusive national identities. I think one of, the, one of the key challenges for the European Union in the future is to find uh, a new rationale for itself. It was clear in the 1950s that some of the major economic sectors of coal and steel and then a customs union has a, had a basic relevance to reconstruction and growth after the Second World War. But now, what is Europe to ordinary Europeans? What is Europe doing about energy? What is Europe doing about uh, the environment and climate change? What is Europe doing about jobs, for example? All of these issues would require tentative, complex answers to voters who are questioning, why do we have a European Union? So Europe must grapple with a new set of issues in the context of its own increasing diversity? Well, um, I think the attractive part of um, the European Institute is this multidisciplinarity, that is the student uh, um, is confronted with different uh, approaches, fields of analysis, economics, political science, law, international relations, and, and that is uh, of course something that uh, can create uh, a clash of ideas that uh, is very fruitful.